who is with us here. And um, Simon is a psychiatrist based in London, but has also um, gone through an MA and a PhD at the University of Exeter um, in, in Western Esotericism. And um, of course, I know Simon from, uh, from that time. And we're looking forward to hear Simon's paper on the case of the philosopher's egg. And um, so Simon, the word is yours. Thank you very much. Hello. God, Tim, it seems like a hundred years ago, doesn't it? To be perfectly honest. <laughs> you still look the same. <laughs> But anyway, um, before, uh, before I begin, um, I just want to warn everybody, I'll be using some uh, German terms. And uh, I'm not German speaking, so if they sound Welsh, you'll have to forgive me. All right. So let's just share my screen. Is that the right one? Oh. It's the right one. Yes, we can see it. All right, here we go. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. This paper approaches the question of East-West polarities by employing the interaction of what are at first sight Western science and Eastern philosophy in a theosophical context. And it's concerned more with the historical aspect of this exchange prior to, but setting the scene for, the later question of globalization. In this regard, it deploys as a somewhat unusual point of departure, some early developments in the history of embryology. The problem that we shall initially analyze is summarized in Nucci, or perhaps in Ovum, by George Eliot. <coughs> we know what a masquerade or development is and what peculiar shapes may be disguised in helpless embryos. In fact, the world is full of hopeful analogies and handsome dubious eggs called possibilities. The dubious egg in question is presented to us by none other than the grand old dame herself, Elena Petrovna Blavatskaya. The dubiety of said egg and the context of this we shall explore as we proceed. In her esoteric instructions, number one, Blavatsky presents a tabulated comparison which addresses the classic esoteric correspondence of the structure of the cosmic egg with that of the layers of the human embryo in terms of the fetal membranes. The structure of the cosmos she derives from Indian philosophy in the form of the Vishnu Purana. <clears throat> she presents three images of human embryos at early and sequential stages of development. For Blavatsky, there are seven layers to the cosmos, i.e. seven planes of being, as cited from the above text. And she compares this to seven spaces and membranes around the human embryo. <clears throat> this is all pretty standard theosophical discourse. Here is one of the images. This is where things become difficult. <clears throat> Earlier in my career, in what now seems like a past life, I taught anatomy and embryology at Glasgow University, and I realized that something was not quite right about this embryo. And what is not quite right is that it is not human. <clears throat> to illustrate this point, here is a diagram from Gray, which shows a human embryo at a comparable stage of development. If we now then show them side by side, we can compare the differences. It is apparent that in the embryo from the esoteric instructions, the membrane called the allantois, which I have highlighted in yellow, forms an extended sac which surrounds the embryo, i.e. the plate-shaped structure in the middle. <coughs> allantois is Greek for sausage because in the human, as you can see again highlighted in yellow, it forms a rudimentary sausage-shaped structure projecting into the mesodermal stalk, which will eventually become the umbilical cord. It is also apparent that the frilly outside edge of the embryo from the esoteric instructions termed chorionic villi extends all around the embryo, whereas the development of the placenta in the Gray's embryo is localized to what will eventually form the discoid placenta 
of primates and hominids. <clears throat> the form of placentation of the embryo from the esoteric instructions is suggestive of a litter bearing mammal where the babies form in a line along each of the long horns of a bicornuate uterus. Although I can't be certain for various reasons, I think it's a dog. Theodore von Bischoff had published a famous monograph on canine prenatal development. And in the descent of man, Darwin had compared a human and dog embryo. <clears throat> the question remains, why? Why did Blavatsky substitute a non-human embryo? The answers are speculative, but interesting. One possibility is that she was doing this as part of a synthetic and syncretic process by which she arranged for the correspondence between the embryo and the cosmos to fit when they don't. There aren't, somewhat inconveniently, seven layers surrounding the human embryo. A second possibility takes us on to consider briefly the work of the German philosopher physician Ernst Haeckel. Haeckel is now most famous or perhaps notorious for his De, de recapitu, Recapitulation theory, theory, the law of recapitulation or the law of biogenesis, originally prop, propagated in his Naturliche Schöpfungsgeschichte, the history of creation of 1868, where he also compares human and dog embryos. <clears throat> it's less well remembered that he coined the terms ecology and phylum. The law of biogenesis is summarized in his equally famous phrase, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, and states that in embryo, an individual passes through all the adult stages of the line of species out of which it developed. As a result, embryos at an early stage of development looked, he stated, identical, and he produced his famous embryo plates, shown here as they were produced in his Anthropogenia. <clears throat> It's a possibility that Blavatsky took him at his word and used the early dog embryo thinking that it wouldn't matter as it's identical to the human. She does not say where she took the illustrations for each terrific instruction from. She was, in any case, quite scathing concerning what she interpreted as Haeckel's materialistic monism. However, this was her interpretation and monism is perhaps paradoxically quite a diverse and variegated concept. So-called priority monism deals with the origins of the cosmos from one source. And in this sense, Plotinian Neoplatonism with its origin from the one and Advaita Vedanta with the cosmos being a manifestation of Brahma alone can be considered monist. And Blavatsky's herb is peppered with both. <clears throat> in addition, it is difficult to see how Heichel could be guilty as charged with materialism per se when one of the chapters of Die Weltretzel, The Riddle of the Universe, is entitled The Phylogeny of the Soul. But I digress. Controvers controversy and accusations of fraud over the embryo plates have been an important feature of their legacy. In this slide, we can see the reality of the early stages of development, though it is notable that the yolk sac on one embryo has been left in place to exaggerate the difference. Michael's embryology is born of romantic science and more specifically connected with its English manifestation as transcendental anatomy, notably in the work of Richard Owen, famous for coining the term dinosaur. German romantic science stresses harmony, unity, and is obsessed by the notion of the urtyp or archetype. The emphasis on the original type partly lay behind Heichel's insistence that all embryos be of an identical type. Richard Owen's transcendental anatomy featured the urtip of the morphology of the vertebra, a common pattern underlying all vertebrae, which he described in On the Archetype and Homologies of the Vertebrate Skeleton of 1848. <clears throat> but the notion of the type extended across many disciplines in a typically unifying romantic manner. Thus, we have Goethe exploring the archetypal plant shown on the left of the slide, August Schleicher attempting to reconstruct the Proto-Indo-European language, and Friedrich Kreutzer 
looking for a primeval monotheistic religion. Romantic science then is preoccupied with finding origins and patterns. It is also concerned particularly with development. It is significant that the German romantics were particularly concerned with Entwicklung and Bildung, both connected with personal and spiritual development. In addition, it is not without significance for our account that the term Entwicklungsgeschichte, literally history of development, can mean both evolution and embryology. The particular concern of the Romantic movements in Germany and England with spiritual evolutionism gives us a point of access to a consideration of the purported East-West dichotomy and the theosophical context. <clears throat> Whilst an exchange of ideas had been taking place for several hundred years since the establishment of the East India Company in 1600, the emergence and continuation of these romantic movements very much coincided with the appearance in translations of many Eastern textual materials. As Leslie Wilson averse, Johann Gottfried Herder was instrumental in instilling a mythical image of India and its ideas into the early German Romantic movement. This was largely based on travel books, essays, and the early translations of Sanskrit by such English scholars as Charles Wilkins and Sir William Jones. Important in this regard, and very much in the German Romantic tradition, was the German philologist Friedrich Max Muller. Famous for the production of the 50 volumes of the Sacred Books of the East, between 1879 and 1910, Max Muller's own personal interest in development was that of religion and culture, the basis of which for him was language. He termed his research Religionswissenschaft, the science of religion, and his work was to have a profound influence on Blavatsky's theosophy. She cites him many times in The Secret Doctrine. <clears throat> the linguistic influence is one of the reasons why in the author's personal experience, inside a theosophical discourse tends to be peppered with etymological explanations, some correct, some folk. In spite of Blavatsky's initial admiration for Max Muller, this was not reciprocated. In the 19th century, in the edition of May 1893, he wrote, she was a clever, wild and excitable gal and anybody who wishes to take a charitable view of her later hysterical writings and performances should read the biographical notices lately published by her own sister in the Nouvelle Review. <clears throat> the exchange between so-called Western science and Eastern philosophy, as exemplified by the Theosophist's egg, is complicated by the inheritance of science itself. We have seen how romantic science is influenced particularly by German Romantic notions. However, German Romanticism was heavily influenced by the emerging body of Eastern texts, as evinced by its distinctly Eastern notions of spiritual evolution or development, organicism, a burgeoning pantheism, and ideas of a gestating nature or cosmos. So the division between latitudes is far from clear cut. The East West exchange which is the principal theme of this conference, begs the question of how we are to view the worlds which are supposedly separated by these latitudes. This is far from being a new question. <clears throat> as early as 1950, in his The Oriental Renaissance, Raymond Schwab observed, sometimes qualified by near or far, sometimes identified with Africa or Oceania, when not identified with Russia or Spain, the concept of the East has come full circle. As Sylvain Levy put it, since the world is round, what can this word mean? The term originated with the Roman Empire, which true to its Hellenistic heritage, placed two blocks in opposition, our world against some vague Asia. It appeared in Virgil's Aeneid in the first century before Christ. The people of the dawn, Egypt, and every power of the East. During the first century of the Christian era, this res orientales reappeared 
in the Historiarum Philippicarum of Trojus Pompeius, and Oriens appeared in Tacitus's Germania. Thus, the separation of the continents had become official." End quote. What constitutes Orientalism is another related question. As before Edward Said made it a pejorative term, it meant many things to many people. We do not have space to explore this further. Though by way of a critique of Said, I recommend Robert Irwin's For Lust of Knowing. During the course of this paper, I have considered the exchange of purportedly Eastern and Western ideas in the slightly more unusual context of transcendental anatomy and the interrelationships of the concept of development as its most empirical with the science of embryology and its role in the notion of personal development and the gestation and evolution of the cosmos. The people who populate these pages were subject to what J. Jeffrey Franklin in his The Lotus and the Lion has evocatively termed reverse missionizing and have engaged in a process of what David Chidester, writing in Empire of Religion, called relations of reciprocal reinvention, a constant state of flux in which the dynamics of colonialism certainly had a role, both in terms of reception and appropriation. Aside from anything else, we can see how romantic science sides with three intellectual motifs dominant in the 18th and 19th century, progressivism, comparativism and evolutionism. I shall finish on the difficult point of where to locate the East or the West in this regard. Sorry, in this regard, I have found Martin W. Lewis and Karen E. Weigand's concept of metageography particularly useful. By metageography, we mean the set of spatial structures through which people order their knowledge of the world, the often unconscious frameworks that organize studies of history, sociology, anthropology, economics, political science, or even natural history, and on occasion, transcendental anatomy. To conclude and in summary, these are the points I should like you to take away. A view of the process of syncretism versus science, the relevance of the interrelationships rather than opposition of science and religion, the importance of dynamic interdisciplinarity and reciprocal exchange in the history of science, the problematics of the East-West polarity, and the possibilities of metageography. Thank you.